Hi, I'm Dr. Jason J. Campbell, and I want to thank you for taking the time to watch my videos. Um, this is going to be the official uh, next installment of my Nietzsche Will to Power video lecture series. This is video 91, and it marks the contribution of two new young minds. Um, I got a contribution from Complacency Among Us, a uh, 70-minute contribution and analysis of notes 135 through 139. And then Ian Mathwiz 7 made uh, a 30-minute contribution on the same notes. I want to congratulate both of you. I want to thank both of you from the bottom of my heart for taking the time to make the contribution. It's not an easy thing to ask. Um, I can't even call them students, right? Because they're not my students. I, I don't know these people. I've never met these people. The first time that I had ever seen any of these uh, young men was when they responded to the video lecture series and it's 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 so gratifying to know that um, people are interested in taking control of their education. I especially want to thank Secular Numinous for everything that he's done to help promote uh, this lecture series. I, I didn't recognize it until the end of um, Ian Mathwiz 7's um, video contribution that he he thanked Secular Numinous, so thank you, Secular Numinous, for um, you know spreading the word. I, it's just great to see um, so many young minds getting together, all discussing the same things. Um, it really is what free air intended education to be. It's not me, the educator, telling you what the right answers are. As Pogo Bat said in his amazing video, it's not about just regurgitating facts. If anything. Um, if anything is antithetical to the concept of philosophy, it's the regurgitation of facts. And what ends up happening is we we now have three young minds who are making contributions, and I couldn't be more I couldn't be more gratified as an educator. This is what all educators aspire for. It's not about the publications. It's not about accolades. It's not awards. It's not plaques. None of that matters. It's about showing the next generation of scholars, of critical thinkers, how to go about thinking how to go about recognizing complex bits of information and making sense of it. And I take my hat off to the three of you. Um, you can click on any of the links. Um, click on the first link, Secular Numinous, and watch his initial um, seminal video response. You can watch Complacency Among Us, his video response. Or most recently, you can watch um, Ian Mathwith Seven's uh, contribution. This video... Uh, video 91 is your video. It's your education. Um, I really would implore the next video contribution, and I don't know when that will be because video uh, um, book book two is pretty substantial, and I'm already in the process of sort of digesting the material and formalizing my notes and scheduling my video shooting uh, so that I can go through book two. Um, as quickly as possible. I might stop somewhere in between, you know, notes in book two to offer another um, call for contributions. And I hope the, the three the three men that contributed contribute. With that, with that being said, um, um, when I offer the next video contribution, if it's during the middle of book two, or if it's at the beginning of book three, I would like to see um, women make contributions. I, I don't want it to just be men that are young men that are making these contributions. I would love to see this is an opportunity for women to have a voice and for women to make uh, a contribution to the lecture series. And, and not even just women. I mean, I would love to see minorities, right? I would love to see minorities make contributions to this as well. Give it, give, you know, give your interpretation on Nietzsche. Because when this video series is done, there won't be any more opportunities to make contributions. And I'm already glad that the, the series isn't just me and my interpretations. It's not just academic and it's not just heady. It's, it's, um, it's students and it's just interested individuals in making their contributions. So I, I'm not going to talk um, much more. Again, I want to thank these three men for their, their contributions and you should be commended for your effort. With that, here is the official beginning of uh, Nietzsche's Will to Power notes 135 through 139 um, from these two young minds. Thank you, and I'm Dr. Jason J. Campbell.
So this is going to be my video contribution um, on notes 135 through 139 of Nietzsche's Will to Power at the request of Dr. Jason J. Campbell's you know, call for contributions. Okay, this is a contribution that Dr. Jason J. Campbell asked for. Uh, he recently, about a week ago, made a video asking for contributions uh, on his series on Nietzsche's book the will to power. So I'm going to, I'm actually kind of in a hurry because I only found out about this just recently and I have to kind of be quick about this if I'm going to make his established deadline. So I'm going to be as in-depth as I can, but I'm going to be doing this rather quickly. I would just want to make clear before the assessment that I'm no Nietzschean scholar and my intent behind this contribution is you know precisely that it will be critiqued by others and that um, whoever's watching the videos will be able to uh, come back to my video and correct my my shortcomings or my misinterpretations um, you know so that I will be able to reanalyze the text and gain you know a deeper insight on what I'm actually reading okay so section that we're looking at is uh, the beginning of book two. Alright, so starting with note 135, we have this one's called The Origin of Religion, so obviously he is giving his own opinion on how this stuff originated. Just as the illiterate man of today believes that his wrath is the cause of his being angry, that his mind is the cause of his thinking, that his soul is the cause of his feeling. In short, just as a mass of psychological entities are still unthinkingly postulated as causes, so, in a still more primitive age, the same phenomena were interpreted by man by means of personal entities. Those conditions of his soul would seem strange, overwhelming, and rapturous. He regarded it as obsession and bewitching influences emanating from the power of some personality. Okay, so we got that. Basically what he's saying is that he's project the religious person is projecting his own mind onto the universe. So um, mankind really doesn't credit and credit himself at all for for his accomplishment or his uh, his success in life but rather it's it's so powerful it's it's you know so awesome in magnitude that we can't conceive of it not being the result of a divine force so we attribute this these feelings to to the divine to the otherworldly to the transcendent so in i think in a polemic way he's expressing his own disgust in humanity's inability or unwillingness to posit himself within the world of existence, as opposed to um, a world that's um, you know utterly focused on moral imperatives and aspiring to be what you ought to be, as opposed to what you are. So this is you know what Dr. Campbell was talking about as the the uh, you know the general paradigm for for ethics: what what is versus what ought to be. Thus the Christian, the most puerile and backward man of the age. Now, Nietzsche is rather famous for having little, if anything, positive to say about Christianity. He frequently regards its moral system as the most bankrupt that one could imagine. So, um, you know, I just want to recall that, you know, Nietzsche's sentiment towards Christianity is looked upon with with great bitterness and indignation because you know most critically it he sees it as distancing man from valuing his own humanity from recognizing his own capabilities and to the true extent that he can actualize himself he doesn't and this you know this poses a a really big issue for Nietzsche because insofar as humanity doesn't see himself as, well, see itself as um, as something valuable or something you know worth uh, worth putting effort into. Um, man is is diminishing himself.
before he even recognizes the full extent of what he's worth. And I think that Nietzsche, uh, you know, ultimately traces this sentiment, this this uh, value depreciating sentiment, directly to um, to religion. So he actually wants to uh, he wants to explain where where this sentiment originates from. Why why humans are sort of psychologically um, you know predisp uh, predisposed to um, to positing religion, to positing the, the, the need, the, the dependence on something beyond ourselves. Now, notice that near the beginning of that sentence, he describes the religious person as an epileptic among a strong and vigorous race. Now, he obviously does not think this is a good thing. He thinks that religion is a sign of weakness and one of the reasons why humanity has gone to the dogs, essentially, is because of this kind of dogma and weakness. The weakness of the weak of the weak is the cause of their inventing a supernatural realm. Insofar as man sees his own existence without an, an appeal to intentionality, he he regards himself as inadequate uh, and insignificant in the role he plays in the world. So he thinks humanity sees it as trivializing to identify himself along the same lines of existence as everything else in the natural world. Um, and, you know, this again poses a problem for Nietzsche. So it's preferential for man that he regard himself and his existence as divinely inspired, divinely influenced, because insofar as he believes his life is preordained, he ascribes meaning to the pursuit of the highest moral values and psychologically the comfort he derives from this you know from this uh, this preoccupation of achieving values sort of uh, conceals the pain and despair that would otherwise be experienced had he espoused the Christian worldview so his dispute Nietzsche's you know fundamental dispute is is rooted in the frustration with the appeal that Christianity offers its potential followers and and its followers, um, that being you know so clever as to devise ways in which to ensure its legitimacy. So for Christianity to remain relevant, it needs to find a way to reconcile what it posits and what it what it says it's you know it's in opposition to versus you know the state of affairs on the ground evil, suffering, despair, uh, hopelessness, you know, you name it, the, the, you know, the evident reality that is, is there when we walk outside of our door every day. The psychological logic is as follows. When the feeling of power suddenly seizes and overwhelms a man, and this takes place in the case of all the great passions, a doubt arises in him concerning his own person. He dare not think himself the cause of this astonishing sensation, and thus he causes a stronger person, a godhead, as his cause. We doubt that this is a part of us. We have strong doubts that, that us, us meager, um, weak, dependent beings can possess, um, you know, power and capability to this magnitude. We can't accept that, and we doubt that. And, and Nietzsche saying religion, religion fosters that doubt. Religion um, enables us to to make this this division in the human being, and only accept one half of who we are. Only accept you know the weak half, which which does us no justice. We we are, we are complete, and we are complete in that we have those weak aspects, but we also have the ability to. To be strong and and to to with to hold within us things that surprise us and astonish us, um, but because of this we have an altered personality. So it, we we conceive we conceive these these unfamiliar feelings as being otherworldly and as being imposed onto us by the external. So I wanted to underscore that. So basically, he's taking, he's dividing himself into two sides. 
he calls one of them God, and he ascribes to that all in him that he sees as good, and then everything else is just the imperfect nature of man, or it's Satan, or something along those lines. The implication of this is that man divides himself into two persons, so that, you know, man recognizes the weaker half of himself as what he completely amounts to, as, as the totality of, of himself. He's completely ignoring the superhuman aspect that he would that he otherwise, you know, attributes to God. Um, and Nietzsche goes on to talk about this, this division in uh, note 136. We are really, as human beings, distancing ourselves greatly from where we are rooted in reality. Our, our rooting in reality is that we are biological creatures, that we do live within a world that is is somewhat predictable and functions according to the laws of nature and it's very dangerous to not have the the awareness and not being in not having the um the psyche that you know that's developed enough to to accept this and to live with with this type of knowledge that there is a law of nature and that we function within it and that we can't affect it to some you know to to any any extent back to Nietzsche religion is an example of the alteration of the personality a sort of fear and sensation of terror in one's own presence but also a feeling of inordinate rapture and exaltation among sick people the sensation of health suffices to awaken a belief in the proximity of God. So in other words, as we were saying earlier, when a weak person feels strong, he has to, he can't believe that it was himself doing that. He has to assume that it was someone else. The unfamiliar and the unknown overwhelm man. And we just talked about that. We just talked about the fact that, um, Being that I can't explain something uh, makes me feel inadequate as as a living thing. That it makes it makes me feel like I I don't have a place. It makes me feel lost. It poses a frontier of emptiness in front of me, in which I have to make the decision of which direction to go. And insofar as I make a decision. Whatever happens to me, because I take because I've taken that path. Whatever happens to me, is is my doing, and it's it's my responsibility, and I'm accountable for that decision. And that is a very very terrifying thing, to you know to humanity, or at least this is what Nietzsche is saying. And he you know he's not the only one to to have said this. Fromm talks about this. Psychoanalyst Eric Fromm, um, you know, talks exclusively and you know, extensively about this very thing, this, the notion of freedom and how terrifying it is. And it's also a big theme in, in existentialist philosophy. Man gradually takes possession of the highest and proudest state of his soul, as also of his acts and his work. Formerly, it was believed that one paid oneself the greatest honor by denying one's own responsibility for the highest deeds one accomplished, and by ascribing them to God. So, this is another tenet of Christianity, at least most denominations, which is that you are no longer responsible for your actions because you're saved, and therefore, once you're saved, you, it doesn't matter what you do, you're basically guaranteed uh, to go into heaven. And it's basically a way of avoiding responsibility for one's actions. All changes are effects. All effects are effects of will. The notion of nature and natural law is lacking. All effects presuppose an agent. Rudimentary psychology. One is only a cause oneself when one knows that one has willed something. So in other words, he's trying to analyze the psychology of the religious man, at least the basics of it. And 
the religious person, according to Nietzsche, is basically claiming that everything must be the result of some kind of will. We, we constantly hear the, the mantra of, you know, man containing uh, original sin, you know, and to, to what extent this is literal or to what extent this is symbolic, I think, is, is immaterial on, on this level of discussion. Because insofar as man sees himself as, as inherently flawed, as deficient in something, he really has no inclination or desire to, to seek within himself solutions to improve himself. He seeks external stimuli, external forces to, um, to complete himself and to, um, to, to make man more... Um, more perfect in a way and there's another result of this and it's that you often find religious people not all religious people granted but a lot of religious people saying things like I'm nothing without God without God I can't do anything I'm completely powerless and I think that that's kind of a result of what Nietzsche Nietzsche's analysis is here religion has lowered the concept of man its ultimate conclusion is that all goodness, greatness, and truth are superhuman and are only obtainable by the grace of God. So in other words, it's impossible to be good or it's impossible to know the truth without God. That's right what Nietzsche is getting into and I think that it is prevalent in a lot of religious people. Attainment of truth means being, having knowledge of God and having having a high accessibility of knowledge to God. Priests are the actors of something which is supernatural, either in the way of ideals, gods, or saviors, and they have to make people believe in them. In this they find their calling. This is the purpose of their instinct. In order to make it cre as credible as possible, they have to exert themselves to the utmost extent in the art of posing. Their actors' sagacity must, Above all, aim at giving them a clean conscience by means of which alone it is possible to persuade effectively. So basically, it's the job of the priest to make this seem plausible to other people, uh, even though it really isn't plausible at all. But the priest, of course, has power, but this power is is um, inherited from. Uh, from the divine, from from legitimacy in religion, so the priest is seen as this this um, this model, this representation of of um, of God's power. So yeah, of course there are going to be other people in society who wield power, but the priest has a power of a different nature. This priest doesn't need to be physically. Um, powerful. It doesn't, he doesn't need to be threatening. He doesn't need to be um, perceived as, you know, so something to be, to be feared because of, of, you know, his physical stature or his, his assertiveness. And why is this? Because, as, you know, ultimately he stands as a representation of, of God, of an omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent entity, an agent of God. So this is really why the priest um, is legitimate and this is why the priest wields the most power without having to be himself anything uh, perceived as threatening or like we were just talking about. And finally, note 139. The priest wishes to make it an understood thing that he is the highest type of man, that he rules even over those who wield the power, that he is indispensable and unassailable, that he is the strongest power in the community, not by any means to be replaced or undervalued. So basically, priest, just like any other human, is driven by power, and the priest therefore want everybody else to think that they are the most important people in the community that they can't be replaced. That's how they satisfy their desire for power. 
the priests is to impose a very structured um, society that has a distinct um, higher order and a you know very distinctive lower order of people, and this needs to be preserved because this is how the the power is conferred effectively, and this is this is what um, keeps people effectively oppressed because they are in such a a low um, a low um, caste of in society. So, I mean, the implications that this kind of this kind of paradigm has on um, social and cultural aspects of life. I think the argument can be made that it's it's very relevant. It's not just it's not just to be um, discussed on uh, a religious platform. There are a bunch of uh, things here. First of all, Nietzsche, in my interpretation, is arguing that it is because of Christianity because of religion that we still have this conservative force in society, one that wants to maintain order even at the cost of liberty. But it gets even uh, more in depth than that because he says every free tendency overthrows the laws of marriage. And that's kind of getting into, for example, in the early 20th century, interracial marriages was a kind of controversial issue and it was mostly religious people who thought that marriage should only be between white or between black. And even more contemporary, we have the issue of gay marriage and lesbian marriage because a lot of, uh, a lot of times you hear the argument that it's a threat to marriage, it's a threat to the family. In fact, Almost every single anti-gay organization I can think of has the word family in its name. So, with that being said, uh, you know, I just want to thank Dr. Campbell for giving his followers the opportunity to participate and contribute to this uh, lecture series. It's been a good experience, so thank you again. So, there you have it. That's my interpretation of these five uh, notes that appear in Nietzsche's will to power. And like I said, it's not the most in-depth I've done. I tried to do it as in-depth as I could quickly because, as I said, I am in a hurry trying to make the deadline here. Uh, yeah, Dr. Jason J. Campbell, uh, I do really enjoy your videos. Um, I haven't really gotten the opportunity to watch the entire Nietzsche uh, series that you're doing, uh, mostly because it's uh, like a lot of videos at the moment for me to watch, and I only found out about it from Secular Numinous just recently. But uh, I hope that you use the this interpretation that I've just provided, or not, as you will, and um, bye.